Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is going to be a really exciting seminar. I am Mike Pinkunis. I'm a research fellow at the United Nations University International Institute for Global Health, located here in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. I'm a collaborator with a lot of our presenters today. And I, I want to be the first to say welcome. Good afternoon to our attendees in the Western Pacific and, and good morning to our, our friends and colleagues joining from the UK. This is going to be a, a really exciting seminar. So this is a part of a, of a broader seminar series on health policy and systems research, which is organized by our host, the Institute for Health Systems Research, as a part of their role as a WHO collaborating center for health systems research and quality improvement. This seminar itself is also one of the activities under our larger joint project, and that project is called Accelerating the Development of Health Policy and Systems Research Capacity in the Western Pacific for Health System Strengthening. And so this collaborative project is funded by the National Institute for Health Research in the UK. So today we'll be hearing from five speakers who will each provide their insights into how health policy and systems research can contribute to an effective response to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. But before we get started with the presentations, I have just a couple points of housekeeping. So first of all, we would really appreciate it if everybody could keep their microphone muted throughout the duration of the seminar. Also, you can keep your video off. That would be helpful. Secondly, please utilize the chat feature. So down on that bottom portion of your, to of your toolbar, you'll be able to interact with your other colleagues in the seminar, but perhaps more importantly, with the presenters. And this is where you can log your questions. So the questions will be there in the chat for everybody to see. And at the end of the seminar, we've reserved some time for a Q&A with the panel. And then lastly, the webinar is being recorded. So it'll be made available later on YouTube, I believe on the IHSR webpage. So this is for your colleagues who are unable to join the live presentation, but also for you if you wanna go back and rewatch it. So with that, I want to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Zul Abdul Karim. So Dr. Zul is a senior researcher and head of the Center for Health Services Research at IHSR. He is the co-lead for our HPSR Strengthening Project in Malaysia and in the Western Pacific. He's interested in strengthening health policy and systems capacity, developing competencies and teaching tools, especially with a focus on the Western Pacific region. He will be introducing today's topic and will help provide context for the rest of our speakers. Dr. Zul, please, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mike. Hello, everyone. I'm Zol, um, the leader of the project. Uh, as you know, the title of the web this webinar is uh, COVID-19 Health Policy and System Research is Crucial for an Evidence-Based Response. So this title is selected with the aims to demonstrate how health policy and system research is related or could be used to improve countries' health system response using the COVID-19 situation. We should be anchored by evidence-based decision making. So let me begin with the introduction with definition of HPSR. So there are many definitions that are being used. For example, the definition by the Alliance for HPSR, as well as the definition in the HPSR methodology leader by Lucy Gilson, published by London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in 2012. But a simple definition of HPSR it is a field of study considering how health systems are organized, financed, and governed, which is the building blocks, and for what outcomes, which is the goals, who drives these processes, and how do they do it, which is the actor, and what factors, whether it is political, social, economical, or institutional, which make health systems as they are, which is the power or context. So this area of research could facilitate us to be able to understand the complexity and dynamic of health system. So 
Sorry. Okay. okay. So uh, this area of research could facilitate us to be able to understand the complexity and dynamic of health system and knowledge translation processes so that it can be improved and strengthened. So we are going to show it through this presentation. So enjoy this presentation. Mike, uh, your floor, please. Thanks, Dr. Zool. Really good overview there. Nice introduction. Good reminder around the the complexities and the, the dynamic nature uh, of health systems. So with that, I would like to introduce our first panelist. So this is Professor Martin McKee. Martin McKee is a professor of European Public Health and the medical director at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's also the research director for the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies and is the past president of the European Public Health Association. He's trained in medicine and public health and has written extensively on health and health policy with a particular focus on countries undergoing political and social transition. With that, Professor McKee, please. Good morning and good evening wherever you are. I'm hoping that you can see my screen by now. It's difficult to tell from here. Mike, yep, looks good. Looks good. good. Okay. So what I'm going to do is run through some elements of the United Kingdom's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm going to take, as I take us through it, I'm going to look at some of the competencies that we recommend uh, for training in health policy and systems. And those competencies will be up at the top right hand corner of a number of slides. So if you could bear those in mind as we go through. So the first thing to do is to ask, well, where are we? How have we done? And what I've done here is to rank the countries of the world in terms of the numbers of cases of COVID, in terms of millions of cases. And you can see the top five countries, United States, Brazil, Russia, India, and the United Kingdom. So the United Kingdom has cut is fifth in this league table, not a good place to be, unfortunately. And it's very clear that we have really not done very well at all, particularly compared to our European neighbors, but also uh, with uh, compar in comparison with other parts of the world. I've put beside the um, uh, bars on the graph our political leaders, because I think this is important. We cannot get away from the political determinants of health. And I'm sure those of you who will uh, be looking at this slide will see one thing uh, that stands out immediately. First, all of them are men, and you will no doubt be asking where the women are, and uh, we can see that they're actually down here in the rest of the world, because uh, from Jacinta Ardern to uh, right through to the uh, leaders of Taiwan, Iceland, Finland, and Angela Merkel, of course, uh, these are the countries that have done particularly well. No country with a female leader has done especially badly, although, of course, there are countries with male leaders who have done well as well. But the other point that is very important about this is these are all populist leaders. They are leaders who have uh, appealed to uh, the people against the elites. And the elites, of course, are people like those of us in this webinar. We're the people who have gone to university, who studied, who have tried to understand the health uh, situation, tried to understand the evidence. And for a number of these people, we are the a number of these political leaders, we are the enemies of the people. So I think that's important to bear in mind that populism and rejection of evidence, uh, unfortunately, uh, is not very good when you're faced with a pandemic. Uh, the tragedy of all of this is, of course, that the coronavirus does not actually follow President Trump on Twitter. So moving on, how did the UK um, how did the UK respond? Uh, here we're looking at the competency of understanding health systems, their complexity and the policy process. So the first thing that the UK did was nothing. Uh, as Italy was locking down, the Prime Minister um, rejected going beyond what he said was medically rational to the point of doing real and unnecessary economic damage. His view was that other countries might be doing things, but there was no need for the UK to do that because we would just sit back and watch them do damage to themselves. And meanwhile, we would be fine. Uh, there was a strong sense of English exceptionalism. And I stress English because the UK is four nations uh, and Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have increasingly diverged, as we'll hear later. 
The WHO advice at this time was to test, 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 but our deputy chief medical officer uh, really gave voice to this exceptionalism by saying, the clue for WHO is in its title. It is a World Health Organization, and it is addressing all countries across the world with entirely different health infrastructures, and particularly public health infrastructures. We have an extremely well-developed public health um, Sorry, somebody wants to annotate. Okay. There is an extremely well-developed public health system in this country. And in fact, our public health teams actually uh, train others. Uh, so here we can see a view that while well, Germany, France, Italy, many other countries um, were implementing widespread testing, there was a sense that the UK did not need to do that. Right, um, I need to get rid of that annotation now, having agreed to do it. Sorry, I'm having um, having answered the yeah. Uh, so just to get so the, the whenever we did actually respond, uh, then the uh, situation was that the the challenge was that we had actually seriously underinvested in. Uh, the systems of governance. For a decade, British governments had been cutting the civil service centrally and in local government. And for 10 years, when, fast, when faced with a, a complex task, the response had typically been to go to one of the large outsourcing companies or the large accountancy companies, G4S, Circo, ones like that. The problem was that these companies had failed repeatedly, time after time, be it on probation services, prison services, security at the Olympic Games, or whatever. Um, it was one failure after another, but the government kept going back to them because there was an ideology that we should be, uh, that government should not be doing things, other people should be doing, you buy things in rather than make it them yourself. And then we got to the ludicrous situation where the government decided that an accountancy company um, was actually the best one to run a complex virology testing service. We. Um, then when we look at what we actually did, sorry, it's just difficult to control here. Um, we can see the problems that arose by having this outsourcing approach. There was a lack of any whole systems approach. Now I've put in the right hand side of the slide, a graphic that we did on the independent scientific advisory group. I'll talk a little bit about it later. Uh, but what we needed was a coordinated system to find, test, trace, isolate and support people. What was put in place was no coherent system for finding cases. The hope was that people would um, come forward if they had symptoms, but they would not be looked for actively. There were five different pillars for testing with none communicating with each other. Uh, they included antigen and antibody testing. And only this morning, we've had a letter uh, written by 40 senior academics arguing that the antibody testing program is not fit for purpose multiple contact tracing systems, none communicating with each other. So a number of organizations like the police, for example, have set up their own separate ones because of a lack of confidence in the official system. There were requests to contacts of people who had the disease to isolate, but no monitoring. And if you did isolate, you would get support from friends, families, a bit from local government, but really anybody you could find. So there was no attempt to get a whole systems approach in place. We do know that health systems are complex. This is a diagram that we put together for a forthcoming paper, uh, which looks at the testing and tracing and isolating system. And uh, you can see that there are many obstacles and it's important to work out what the obstacles are, what the facilitators are. And in this case, we did it in the, in the format of a simple children's board game uh, to make the point. But I think what we found was that because nobody actually went through the system on the ground. Now, in a lot of our work and some of the work that some people in the webinar are involved with us in, in Malaysia and the Philippines in particular, but in some other countries, we've done a lot of work talking to people on the front line to try to find out how systems work for them, people with hypertension in poorer areas and so on. It's really important to look at the reality of the health workers and of the patients and others who are using the system, and that was not done. However, what we do have are a number of accounts of people who have been working in the system, and this is where the qualitative data are critically important, as well as the quantitative data. So this individual who was writing anonymously in the British Medical Journal said, NHS professionals employed us as clinical tracers, but we were recruited by Capita, a private company, and placed with Public Health England. 
Sithil provided access to the tracing application as another company, and all of these required different usernames and passwords. Synergy CRM assigned cases and held scripts. CTAS captured contract test tracing information. Ring Central was used for voice calls. I mean, it was amazing that anybody could ever find their way through any of this system. Though, in fact, it wasn't a system at all. It was just a fragmented uh, set of arrangements. Now, another skill competency that we require in health systems and policy research is to critically appraise data and evidence related to health systems. We had persistent problems in collating the data. Initially, the only deaths reported were those of people who had a positive test. And at this stage, testing was very limited because our capacity to do tests was far behind that in countries like Germany. The deaths were only reported if they occurred in hospitals. So we completely missed a phenomenon of a growing epidemic in care homes. And now that we have data from the Office of National Statistics, we know that the death rate is actually much higher than the deaths reported from the National Health Service. So as a number of people have said, we've been flying blind. We need to be able to critically appraise data and evidence related to health systems. There is a government scientific advisory group in emergencies but also because of concern about that, because its membership was confidential and evidence was not published. An independent scientific advisory group was convened by a former government chief scientific advisor. And I should say I'm a member of this uh, group and it has a mix of disciplines and expertise. It, it looks much more widely uh, across disciplines and particularly includes much more public health uh, than the, the formal group uh, and crucially, it has public consultations and all of the evidence is published. Now, the evidence from the official one is now published. Most of the membership of the official one is now published, but it took a long time. And that was a problem for trust, unfortunately. And trust is absolutely essential. We find time and again in the UK, for example, during the mad cow disease many years ago when the government was um, actively trying to, a different, well, well a, different, a previous government was effectively concealing what was happening and the uh, and people lost trust in it. And then whenever the government was telling the truth with the measles, mumps, rubella vaccination, a lot of people did not believe it. So trust is really crucial and that fits into the ethical reasoning and practice. The government's messaging was severely damaged when the prime minister's closest advisor took a long drive to stay with his family uh, his wife was apparently ill um, when everyone else was told not to. Then, some days later, he was seen at a local beauty spot, which happened to be on his wife's birthday, and he claimed he made the 40 kilometre trip to check his eyesight to make sure he could drive safely before driving home. And you can see this is just one of the many uh, humorous uh, pictures that's been put up in Barnard Castle, where he went to with an eyesight test. Uh, frankly, the explanation was ludicrous, but it seriously undermined trust in, uh, in the government and has been hugely problematic as a result. We need leadership and mentorship. The challenge has been who is in charge. Initially, the four UK nations did coordinate their responses, but over time they've diverged, largely due to a lack of confidence, even if they're not saying so publicly, in what was happening in England. It wasn't helped when the Prime Minister, the Chief Medical Officer and the Cabinet Secretary all became ill with COVID-19 at the same time. We only found out about the Cabinet Secretary's illness afterwards. Um, and uh, this was particularly problematic because it was in a government that has imposed an unprecedented degree of control from the Prime Minister's office. So when the Prime Minister's office was not functioning, there was a le real leadership vacuum. And as one of the newspapers said, it's chaos. Building partnerships and networks is extremely important, but we've had fragmentation. I won't go through all the details, but there's been a lack of communication between almost everyone that is involved. But, and this may seem very negative, but of course I don't really need to be negative because the figures speak for themselves. The uh, course of the epidemic, the number of cases, the number of deaths is very clear. The UK has not done well. There have been areas in which we've done very well indeed. And this is because I think we have a very strong health research infrastructure. The UK has been very successful in ensuring that as many COVID-19 patients as possible are entered into clinical trials, vastly more than is the case in the United States. 
And that has been enabled us to show that low cost dexamethasone does reduce deaths in hospitalized patients. It confirmed that there's no clinical benefit from the use of hydroxychloroquine in hospitalized patients. So I think this is something that we can celebrate and highlights the importance of having research integrated with clinical care. I'll leave you with some further information. I'm research director of the European Observatory on Health Systems and Policies, and we have a COVID-19 health system response monitor. And uh, this has data from primarily European countries, uh, but also links to some elsewhere. And you can read about what the countries are doing, how they're responding, and a whole series of analytic papers that compare what's going on. So with that, I'll finish and hand back to you, Mike. Great. Thank you, Professor. Really nice overview of the response there uh, in England and a good reminder. Leadership is needed and particularly when we're speaking about the, the four UK nations and uh, really appreciate your, your overview of the competencies and that image there first of the, the political determinants of health. I thought that was very telling, so appreciate that. Next, we're going to move into the Western Pacific re region with Dr. Catherine Ann Reyes. Professor Reyes is an assistant professor of health policy and administration at the University of the Philippines in Manila. She also serves as an associate dean for research at the UP Manila College of Public Health. She's a trained physician, health policy analyst, researcher, and educator, and is actively contributing to the development and implementation of health reforms both in the Philippines and in the Western Pacific region. Dr. Reyes, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'll be sharing with you the Philippine experience in responding to COVID-19 in the lens of health policy and systems. All right, so um, just to give you a context, um, the, the Philippines have had previous experience um, in outbreaks and as well as um, epidemics. Uh, we have um, encounters with SARS, H1N1, and MERS-CoV, and these prior experience have somehow helped us um, think through our surveillance systems um, as well as our um, our plans. So there are uh, plans in place. We have we do uh, subscribe to international conventions on how to approach an outbreak, and the Philippines has also uh, established an interagency governance structure that is designed to. Um, put together a, a coherent response at the national level. Um, I would like to note, though, that even with this previous experience, and, and indeed, uh, there were lessons that we were able to um, uh, learn from, and, and it actually uh, contributed into the plans that are in place at the Department of Health, uh, there was a uh, very minimal, minimal um, interaction as well as discussion um, among other stakeholders. So basically, most of the lessons, the, the uh, evidence um, from the previous um, encounters with um, outbreaks and epidemics were mostly internal within the government. Uh, there wasn't uh, a lot of discussions around it, and even a research, you know, a, a co coherent uh, and structured research from our, from our historical encounter with outbreaks and epidemics and really systematically um, collate our lessons and learning and then incorporate that into our system improvement. So in that part, uh, there's still a lot to be done. Um, I would also like to put the context that Philippines was in uh, the process of implementing universal health care prior to COVID-19. So this concept about, uh, around health systems, it's already there. And uh, this is not an accident. This is a result of decades of work in trying to really understand what do we mean by integration? What do we mean by health system? What do we mean by a health system approach? And uh, it's notable that a part, uh, a section in that law, uh, specifically specifically mentioned the role of research. And um, this is also not an accident. This is a result of uh, several years of putting up infrastructure in health, in, in, in health research. Um, first, 
um, around biomedical research and then clinical research. And then years back, um, there was really a purposive uh, way to expand um, research on health policy and systems. So there was a program that was established, uh, including allocation of funds. And this uh, development in the health research infrastructure was put in place um, together with the universal health care. So I would actually look at COVID-19 in the Philippines as, in a way, as some interruption in our UHC um, reform. Um, it was around January this year that um, we started to really talk about COVID-19, uh, discuss the policies, our inbound border control, um, convening of um, the interagency task force. And it's noticeable that uh, from the time that we had our first confirmed case around end of January, we have sort of a break. And then we, we then uh, recorded our first local transmission around March uh, in this year. And then uh, that escalated into a lockdown uh, mid-March in 2020 uh, in this year. So as you can see, um, even when we are in the midst of, of the UHC reform, um, the adaptation and really the application of a systems perspective in responding to an event um, is still something that we really need to work on and make it more um, for, uh, second nature, so to speak. So basically, when we look at an event, when we look at an emergency, we focus on that event and uh, it's still a, uh, a challenge to really put everything into the context of health system. In fact, um, it was around end of March towards early April that the, the discussions around health system capacity for COVID-19 was um, discussed more um, in the public sector because it was mostly then a discussion within um, internal technical groups. It was only around April that the discussion became mainstream. People began to talk about um, capacity on testing, um, beds, quarantine facilities, PPEs, and actually put the numbers out there. And one of the struggle really was because we need to, to have more information. So uh, getting information, getting data was not uh, as fast as we would have wanted it to be in, in this situation. So we still need to get those information so that we could um, properly articulate what the plan will be, what the projections will be, and what the timeline looks like in terms of strengthening health facility, uh, uh, the, the health systems. Um, but it is notable that that in the earlier part of um, the, the country's response, there was a, a, a mobilization, a, a, a spontaneous mobilization um, among NGOs, private donors, individual volunteers. They really played a very important role during the early part of the response in terms of mobilizing resources. And I find this notable because um, we, we, ha we have yet to mature, uh, I would say, as a system in terms of having uh, a strong uh, uh, engagement with these stakeholders, but they spontaneously uh, mobilize during the time of crisis. And, and that for me is something that we should pay attention. So there is a, 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 a certain level of networks around the, the government that can actually be mobilized um, when needed. I would also like to note that um, the scientific community was actually mobilized. And so there were official technical working groups, but I think um, in the same way as in the UK, mo most of the internal discussion, like the basis for some of the, of the decisions were mostly internal, um, and then a decision will be made and the decision will be published. But the, the most of the methods, it's, it's internal no, within, within the technical working group. But also notable is that aside from the official um, official technical working groups, there were spontaneous uh, formation of other um, scientific groups, volunteers within professional societies, and even within um, existing research teams that that um, also become instrumental in terms of compiling evidence and feeding this into uh, decision makers, and and that shows us that even if we don't have at the moment a formal body that is automatically mobilized in times of an emergency we do have these networks around us and 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 skills um but i uh, one thing that i have noticed though is that the field of expertise that um has 
work together is still a bit limited. Um, we have seen um, um, people in the health sciences, epidemiologists, public health, data science, and uh, web statisticians, mathematicians, but uh, there were limited participation among social, science, social scientists, for instance. And I would like to go back to the point that in our uh, policy, universal healthcare policy, and how we really want to, to, to uh, respond you know, to certain issue, there was a strong message that the Philippine response to COVID-19 will be guided by science. That was a clear uh, mandate and articulation from the government. But um, I think from the HPSR perspective is that we also need to examine um, which science is actually able to participate and which ones have a link to policy making who can easily speak to those who are making decisions. So we have to understand that further that in this particular um, instance, who are able to speak, who has actually that relationship to impact decisions. Um, we also need to understand that in this time, the, the, um, the situation is evolving very rapidly, but, but we haven't really um, established a mechanism such as found in other countries, like they have rapid uh, evidence synthesis um, capacity, and then that particular capacity is well recognized and it is accepted within government. So uh, we have uh, some limited uh, setup in that in that regard, but really in terms of managing an epidemic, uh, it was mostly ad hoc, um, and it was also mostly um, within internal vetting uh, among experts. And another thing that came up in 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 this discussion around the use of evidence and uh, policy making, um, there was a also a pushback among those who are in non traditional. Um, evidence, so to speak. So these are not your mainstream evidence, not your mainstream science. And, and really, we have, uh, in HPS, HPSR perspective, we really need to understand more how to engage them in, uh, in a more positive way uh, so that we lessen the noise in terms of um, communicating to policymaking. Uh, I would also like to focus on this point that the weight of evidence, you know, so if you look at evidence, you look at what, where we are exactly right now, uh, different sectors will look at evidence in different ways. And I think this is a manifestation of the way that we frame the problem. So what exactly is the policy question that we are answering? So for instance, there was a large discussion and a heated discussion around a uh, return to work policy and the Department of Health after consultation with uh, uh, professional societies, as well as uh, looking at the WHO uh, guidance, um, of course, issued its own policy on this. However, um, the uh, sector, economic sector, the industry um, really had a very strong pushback on this and um, they, they were also pushing for another kind of policy. And, and we see this is a manifestation really of the difficulty of understanding what policy uh, question or problem are we really addressing and how do we make the different sectors appreciate um, the, the problem in the same way you know, so that we can also approach our pathway from problem to, to solution in the same way in, in a more coherent way. And now, uh, going back to my first point earlier, is that there is this is actually an opportunity for us to rethink of um, the the overarching um, framework where the Philippine health system is operating. So it's not it's not supposed to be just about COVID nineteen, but really think of our overall intention to begin with, which, which was really UHC. And we see here that HPSR has a potential in um, helping us to to be on track in our uh, UHC uh, trajectory. So for instance, uh, HPSR has a very good set of framework as well as different disciplines that can help us understand further how to learn from our history, how to learn from our past response, how we have responded uh, during the past months. And 
make use of this so that we can understand how to incorporate resilience and adaptability in our UHC strategy. Uh, it's also very clear from the Philippine experience that we have had issues in governance, communication, as well as trust. And HPSR is a good tool to help us understand this better, how to provide solution to this particular part. Uh, we also see uh, the value of actually involving different communities and how they can engage more with power. Um, also, we it, it actually also time to really seriously uh, increase the discussion around the role of the private sector and how they can um, engage more meaningfully in our UHC uh, track. And my final point is that um, because of the COVID-19, and I think this is also the same for, for other countries, uh, there were discussions around resources uh, because uh, COVID-19, of course, we, we know it's very resource heavy. We have shifted a lot of our uh, resources towards the response. So there is this um, tendency to say that, okay, we cut back with our some of our investments, planned investments in UHC. But I think that with the HPSR perspective really makes the case that you know we should actually invest in ensuring that we are getting the right information and this information has to be within a multidisciplinary perspective it should give us the uh, a picture of the complexity and the uh the dynamism of the health system and how the uhc should be implemented in that context as well as to enable us to really define the important questions that we should be asking, questions that can help us answer um, the, the policy decisions that we have to make so that we are able to get out of, of this situation, not just uh, responding to COVID-19, but also at the same time enab enabling us to respond to our UHC commitment. Thank you. Dr. Reyes, thank you very much for that really nice overview of the experience there in the Philippines. I, I appreciated your comments there around the uh, the interaction with the push for UHC, but still the need for a greater focus on systems, even as the, the COVID-19 crisis was hitting there. So really appreciate that. Uh, I do want to remind everybody, please utilize the chat box. We have a good conversation going there now. Please post some questions there. We'll, we're going to save 10 or 15 minutes at the end of the session for a Q&A with our panelists. So with that, we're going to move from the Philippines to Malaysia, staying in the, the Western Pacific region. Our next presenter is Dr. Awatif Amir Norden. She graduated from the International Medical University of Malaysia in 2009. She underwent her housemanship training at the University of Malaya Medical Center completing rotations in internal medicine, general surgery, and anesthesiology. She joined the Institute for Health Systems Research in 2013. She was recently awarded her doctorate degree in public health from the University of Malaya. Her areas of interest include health services and policy issues related to older adults, as well as those around informal caregiving. Dr. Awatip, please, over to you. Thank you. Uh, let me just check whether my screen is coming up on your side. Um, Not yet. Uh, can you see it now? Yes, looks good. All yeah. right. Okay. okay. So um, hi everyone. So we're here from uh, we're here from the health HPSR team at IHSR. And today, basically, what we are going to do is we're going to briefly narrate actions taken uh, related to COVID-19 and summarize some HPSR reflections. So first of all, just as a very brief introduction, um, just to mention that within the Malaysian healthcare system, priorities of service provision include uh, public health emergencies. It is within the purview of the Division of Disease Control, where the National Crisis Preparedness and Response Center is also located. So activities at the National CPRC cascades to the Medical Division CPRC and State, Opera uh, State CPRC, implemented subsequently in the field by district health teams uh, and hospitals. Strategic framework documents are available, such as the My SAD2 work plan. Um, so within the HPSR lens today, this presentation is narrated via a sequence of three points. 
The first, the report of a pneumonia of unknown cause to the WHO at the end of December of 2019. The second, the first wave of cases in Malaysia, which began with the first four imported cases. And the third, the surge of COVID-19 cases, which came to attention in late February. So with report of this new pneumonia, the context was one of preparedness and the focus was more towards risk assessment of available evidence and being on alert. Now, going to our HPSR lens, if we're going to apply it, one question a health system could ask itself is, what are the existing capacities um, to address this potential problem, even though it has not yet arrived? So adopting an on alert phase, among the first steps taken was to sensitize existing health surveillance mechanisms in the public health system. Country entry points were scrutinized. We put up thermal screening at airports and laboratory preparedness uh, was also taken. And all this was done while maintaining political, economical and institutional uh, activities. Now, the next point that we would have to react to was events following the first case in Singapore where MOH Malaysia was notified that eight close contacts had entered the southern country entry point. The contacts then became identifying cases and preventing local spread of the disease. Now, the health system could ask itself, how robust is preparedness for disaster management, not only to handle a major outbreak that could potentially happen, but one due to a newly discovered disease? In Malaysia, the national CPRC was activated. This became stimulus for actions such as immediate mobilization of rapid response teams for case investigation and contact tracing. Um, so this slide briefly shows the actions taken with advent of the first wave, risk communication, strengthening infection prevention and control measures, inter-ministerial discussion and strategizing efforts on how we can address this outbreak. Uh, moving on. Now, at the end of February, the second wave of COVID-19 cases began to appear. Clusters appeared to be mushrooming, uh, creating alarm, and globally, the cause of the disease continued to be worrying. So now, COVID-19 had translated into a national threat. Uh, not, not only does it have the potential to affect multiple sectors, it can affect all these sectors in major ways. So now, the context has become uh, containment and flattening of the curve. Now, the health system appears to be asking itself what options are feasible to control this transmission because the challenge is at a population level. Also, at this point, many things were coming in. For example, information, information from contact tracing and surveillance systems, statistical modeling uh, projected the peaking of cases, suggesting caution. So, the health system not only enters or not only is in a state of emergency but also in a state of urgency. In Malaysia, existence of legislation and a disaster response protocol at the national level enables a strong interagency responses. Um, but here, from the context of health policy, power becomes a shared entity, uh, governance takes precedence, and all components of the health system require activation, from human resource to medicine uh, to technologies. So on the 18th of March, a movement control order was implemented to curb the rise of cases, uh, to curb an overwhelming tide. So close observation of cases reported daily by the MOH led to improvisations as we went along. For example, enhanced MCO implemented in cases where uh, in places where cases were notably high. Basically, these places were closed off with very tight monitoring by police and military officers. Improvement subsequently in trajectory of cases met possible revision, uh, leading to a conditional MCO with some of the restrictions uh, lifted. Currently, the order is in recovery MCO with gradual opening uh, of economic, education and travel sectors, among others, following strict SOP and much emphasis is given to the practicing of new norms. Um, so from the HPSR lens again, uh, we look at the health system as one that is in continuous um, self-assessment, always asking itself how to further increase um, capacity. So for Malaysia, past experience 
um, and knowledge shared by other countries who had begun facing COVID-19 earlier provided some leverage. While efforts continued to contain the new cases and range of spread, intrinsic factors factors, uh, intrinsic features were reassessed, such as uh, hospital capacity in terms of intensive care, ventilator support, uh, as well as laboratory preparedness. So reflecting upon previous experience, uh, such as MERS, and also learning from the experience of countries such as China in increasing their healthcare capacity, efforts have resulted for Malaysia in increased capacities for diagnostics, intensive care beds and ventilator support by 86%, 89% and 49% um, respectively. Um, simultaneously, best practices for inf infection prevention and control were strengthened and dedicated quarantine facilities uh, were open. Um, now, um, the pandemic of COVID-19 has been described as an unprecedented event in the face of a crisis which began with very little evidence base to begin with. An unprecedented response was also seen uh, in Malaysia. Not only were all government agencies mobilizing efforts to address the pandemic, Community empowerment meant that various initiatives actually came from the communities, from the people of Malaysia. For example, to address shortage of protective personal equipment in tandem with procurement efforts by the government, uh, many members of the community came forth with initiatives such as sewing PPE for the frontliners. Uh, further, despite the burden of MCO on personal lives, uh, financially, mentally, etc., many citizens were favourable of a gradual uh, lifting of MCO. And even the adoption of new norms have kind of been in zest. Uh, so in a way, it is a whole of government, a whole of society response in, in our Malaysian spirit. So going back, just to summarise again, from the lens of the HPSR uh, research that we have conceptualised, we would like to share some reflections with relation to this. So firstly, um, leadership is second to none in planning, coordinating, implementing uh, a response to a pandemic. Secondly, partnership between agencies, between departments, between governmental and non-governmental entities, between leaders and communities, develop a sense of co-production, a common goal, and a shared outcome. Um, and thirdly, communication and willingness to partake in knowledge translation uh, provides leverage, especially when we begun with very little information in the beginning. Uh, so with that, and on behalf of the HPSR team, I thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Great, Dr. Awati, thank you very much for that overview of the, the Malaysian response that emergency and urgency really rings a bell here and the, the interagency response i think is something that a lot of the people on the call have have lived through firsthand being here in malaysia so really appreciate that and now we can see that we have three different country perspectives here we have our uk the filipino response and then here in in malaysia with that, I want to now introduce Dr. Dina Balabanova, who will provide a wrap up and an overview for today's session. Dr. Balabanova is the co-lead for this project and is an associate professor of health systems and policy in the Department of Global Health and Development at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. As our project co-lead, she work, her work focuses on strengthening health policy and systems research capacity, developing competencies and teaching tools throughout the Western Pacific region. Dina, please, over to you. Dina, you're muted. There you go, should be at the bottom of your page where the webinar is open. Okay, you're on. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. This has been extremely interesting to hear all the country experiences. I'm just going to take three minutes to talk to you about something that we learned uh, as a group within Health Systems Global. We had a thematic working group on teaching and learning health policy and systems research, and really trying to think if you have 
um, emergency like the one we're facing now with COVID, or if you're facing complex challenges, for example, we have an emergency, but at the same time, we have uh, in many countries continuing need to care for people with non-communicable disease or provide immunization. So we can't just deal with one piece of the system. We have to deal with everything at the same time. Uh, so really uh, this situation and listening to this country experiences is getting us to ask what could have been done better and why, what exactly is going on? These are countries with wonderful health systems. You know, Malaysia has universal coverage. Um, UK is one of the leaders in primary health care and public health and trains indeed people around the world. So what, what could have been done better? What can we learn from that? And really going back to health systems approaches and what are the key competencies that we need to have in order to understand health system responses and what needs to be done. So together with the group, we created uh, this uh, figure and these, are, these competencies for health policy and system research were derived through extensive process of consultation over three years, which included um, uh, consultation with key leaders around the world uh, within health systems global, but also online surveys and um, a lot of refining. So there's been a multiple versions of that, and that's where we are right now. Uh, but this is not prescriptive. This is just a way to, to to help us to think what is it that we need to know within a health system. And just briefly making a few comments for each of those, I don't want to, to preclude the discussion. So really try, the key thing is we need to understand health systems as a mix of complex elements. And even in the UK, we see this was not done. We had um, very strong interventions in different institutions, but they were not coordinated. They weren't um really thinking around how one program affects the rest of the system and that is yeah, caused sorry, the major yeah, sorry excuse me just for a second can you make the screen full full size or actually the presenter mode please um slideshow mode there you go uh down at the sorry. the upper toolbar should see from current slide to your left. Thank okay. you. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so really trying to, to understand and to recognize. Uh, so very often we have ministers in the UK coming on television and saying we'll do testing and we'll do particular groups or we'll do particular intervention, particular cadre is going to look at that, but no understanding of how this cadre is going to work with anybody else, how what else we need in the system in order for these interventions to work. Then the next uh, component would be really to think about, to assess health systems and programs and to ask the right questions. So a lot of the time um, during this pandemic, we can see programs inter implemented very quickly, introduced without really trying to, to understand what is their main impact, what exactly are we trying to do with this program, very often politically driven. Again, uh, appraising different types of data. And there's been a lot of data, a lot of modeling, a lot of different sort of behavioral data. However, um, the, one of the key problems was that the lack of cross-examination of data, different groups working on different pieces, but really trying to make connections and trying to understand, for example, even a lot of groups talking about the economic impact of pandemic, of different steps that can be taken. At the same time, um, we have public health uh, recommendations. At the same time, we have um, service delivery recommendations. So how do you really put them together? How do you take a holistic view? That's not something, there is no time to wait for scientific papers and then to do an overview or to try to have a consensus building. This is a pandemic, things have to happen quickly. And we don't have this infrastructure in the health systems, seemingly. So another uh, issue that Martin alluded to and everybody is thinking about ethics and the uh, ethical implications of policies. For example, some of the policies that were recommended here in the UK led to um, vulnerabilities for particular groups or isolation. And there wasn't any thinking around how certain policies affect particular groups and what are the ethical, implement ethical implications and what are the accountability mechanisms. If something is not working, how do we know? How do we get a feedback loop from population level? 
And that was not something that was thought about. It was very top down approach. Uh, so uh, the health system really is trying to health system approach would be to think of all the health systems level, meso, micro and, and macro, and trying to think how to connect that and referring to work that we did recently with Fiona Samuels from ODI. So again, thinking not just vertical, horizontal, but thinking about levels, horizontal, meso, meso micro and macro. And finally, really building partnerships and communication. Communication has been one of the major problems in this epidemic. And when we talk about communication as a competency, what do we mean? We mean that we want health system researchers to, to really be able to communicate. And that has been one of the problems within the debate in the UK or many other countries where data and evidence have been politicized. And very often um, uh, uh, commentators and scientists comment as if at the scientific conference, they, as many of you said, the, the response is extremely highly political affair. How do we ensure that these researchers can engage with this process? So just to wrap up, these um, I hope you can use and this competencies framework. Um, it is, we find it extremely useful, not just in terms of planning a response, but in terms of training. So if you're training students, you may want to have a look at this and think, is this something that appeals to you and use it in your programs? So finally, I just wanted to conclude that from what you see on the screen, we really argue, we would like to argue with our team that um, we need a new type of knowledge in order to respond to complex situations, not just COVID, but COVID in the modern world. COVID as, at the same time um, responding to, to economic emergency. Uh, so we really need a new way of thinking, new way of working, which is much more comprehensive and holistic. Um, thank you very much. Dina, thank you very much for that, that wrap up there. It's nice to see everything tied together through the, the HPSR competencies. Um, I, it really hit me when you're talking about the, the continuity of care and around NCD care and um, uh, vaccinations, for example, but also thinking through how these responses impact the vulnerable groups and things like that. So really appreciate that from, from you, Dina. At this point, I wanna encourage our participants to continue posting questions. We still have a few more minutes that we can dedicate to Q&A, and I think it's okay if our presenters can stay on the line just a little bit after the hour, that would be great. Uh, I would invite Martin and Kathy and Awatif to, to join us again here online and also our project co-leads, Dr. Zul and Dina, that would be great. So there were a number of questions that came in through the chat and I'm gonna start off with, with two here and uh, I'll, I'll open it to anyone on the panel. The first one is around primary health and the primary health care, primary health care system. What role primary health care system played in the response to the COVID-19 pandemic, knowing that the UK, Malaysia, and the Philippines all have strong PHC systems? Secondly, while you give that some thought, how do we deal with the leadership competencies while the political door is open? So this one is referring a little bit to the, the political vacuum that is sometimes experienced during these emergencies. So those are the two questions we can start off with. Feel free, anybody to jump in. I'm happy to, but I'll happy to let the others if they want to. Mike, would you, would you like me to jump in? Yes, please, Martin, go ahead. Yeah, well, first of all, the first question, primary care. Uh, the UK has a very strong primary care system, but it has played almost no role in it. Um, the uh, general practices have been largely ignored in all of this. Uh, they're unable to uh, order tests. When the tests are undertaken on their patients, they don't get the results. And this has been largely a function of the fact that the government has gone out to the outsourcing companies who are very good at doing things like, um, you know, if you want a, a new what they call a hospital to be built. Uh, so they got a conference, they got conference centers and filled them full of beds, um, which is easy enough to do. I mean, IKEA could have done that perfectly easily, uh, but uh, they weren't so very good at staffing them. 
And of course, the, the detailed task of negotiating and discussing and setting up arrangements with the existing infrastructure is far beyond their capabilities. So they don't do it. That's why they didn't use the existing laboratories. They didn't use the existing capacity. So I think people in primary care feel very aggrieved that they had the ability to do things, but were left out of it because the, uh, the system was so fragmented. What do we do about educating the leadership? Well, um, yes, indeed. Um, I think uh, if we look at the, uh, the countries that have done worst in all of this, as I did, uh, you know, we can see people here who are clearly not stupid. Uh, well, I'll rephrase that four out of, well, three out of the five of them are probably not stupid. Um, and um, therefore it's a matter of application. I think it's a, an open secret that Prime Minister Johnson um, does not uh, do detail. Uh, he does not, he, he does not spend a lot of time reading papers. Uh, and uh, I think that's the challenge. I'm sure he would be able to understand them if he did actually bother to do that. Uh, so I, I think how you would educate him is, I think, would require, I think, a, a different personality. But of course, none of these people were actually elected for their ability to deliver on things. They were elected for other reasons. So uh, that's the uh, the challenge. Thanks, Professor. From our other panelists, any follow up comments? Um, I'd like to speak quickly on the issue on primary health care. So even before COVID-19, we have actually been struggling with our primary health care infrastructure, and that is one of the reform focus of our universal health care. And the uh, salience of the issue actually reflects that. Now, during the early part of the pandemic, there was a very clear focus on the response at the hospitals. And we have to strongly change the narrative that the front line should be at the primary care level not the hospital like hospital is the end of the line we have to change the narrative and it was quite challenging because we really uh, were struggling uh, uh, even before the pandemic but we hope that with with this experience as well as the continued push for universal health care we could really focus more effort as well as well as investments in strengthening primary health care because we've seen uh, and understand i think more the public has understand more the importance of primary health care Thank you. Uh, with regards to, Please go. to primary care, uh, sorry. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah. So, with regards to the primary care um, uh, involvement in Malaysia, so basically, as mentioned, all all of the all of the care providers were mobilized, regardless whether they're in hospital care or in primary care, uh, involved in certain. Uh, programs such as even uh, in terms of uh, creating guidelines, uh, being involved in mobilization of human resource, uh, planning for procurement of supplies. Everyone has a say uh, in what goes on. Uh, but at the primary clinics itself, they're also involved with the contact tracing, uh, testing of, because we do targeted community testing. So do, they do the testing of, um, of uh, the person under investigation at the clinics itself. So, um, an important component is the coverage of clinics because we have we have a distributor clinic that covers the areas uh, of Malaysia and enables us to reach uh, the communities that we need to actually uh, address. Furthermore, not just activities for COVID in the primary care, there is prioritizing, meaning streamlining of, yes, we address activities for COVID, but we also uh, look at the other essential services. So we did not leave behind maternal child health services or the NCD services that continues on, despite everyone actually, you know, chasing after COVID-19. So a lot of things were happening uh, simultaneously, even in the primary care level. Thanks, Dr. Awatith. Actually, I have a follow up for you from, uh, I believe, one of your colleagues here. The question is, what challenges what were the challenges faced by Malaysia in, in its response? In hindsight, what could have been done better? Mm. Now, that's a very complex question, uh, considering that we are trying to answer this from uh, a health system's 
perspective, which is already complex to begin with. But I think I would I would prefer to use the analogy of a glass half full or, or half empty, uh, meaning that, um, of course, when we look at the glass as half full, we had certain established systems, like a very strong primary, prime, uh, public health system, uh, established uh, surveillance system, etc. But when we when we try to deal with a, a pandemic of this, uh, a massive event such as this, whatever that we know becomes challenging because of the burden, the burden of the, the tidal wave, if you prefer that term. Uh, so what happens was looking at the glass as half full, meaning, yes, realizing that we are limited in terms of human resource, in, term, in terms of medical equipment, supplies, etc., but optimizing uh, what we have. So certain initiatives were taken to overcome those challenges. For example, um, uh, streamlining your in-house, for example, in a, clin in a clinic, for example, you would try to prioritize uh, some personnel for COVID-19 and at the same time rotate them, uh, other staff addresses the other issues. So, um, it, would be, it would be complex to answer what could have been done better, but uh, what comes out is we have optimized uh, whatever that we have. Great, thank you for that. I'm going to go ahead and read two more. I am cognizant that we're, we're over our time limit already, but I don't want to cut the conversation short. So I'll go ahead and read two more for our, our panelists and uh, feel free to jump in our project co-leads as well. So we have on our panel uh, both academics as well as people trained in medicine, but this is specifically around the role of of academics. So what do we think is the appropriate role for academics in responding to an issue so great that is affecting humanity? And then the second one is around uh, service delivery shortages. So what policies would be required to overcome shortages of service delivery systems, particularly in developing countries where UHC has not yet been achieved? If I can just uh, start, I just say two words about the, um, the first question, the role of academics. When we were doing the international surveys and analysis of what is the HPSR, we were very surprised to see how many people felt strongly that academics should be there together with uh, key actors, um, really together arguing with politicians, not just being and purely academics. We thought this separation in the Western, Northern culture is very strong, that academics do research and then they do some engagement to disseminate their results, but they're not really involved in the, in the political sort of games. So I wonder, I would love to hear what Martin would say about it, but that came very strongly from our members, HSG, and just saying, really, academ uh, academics should produce evidence, but Sometimes it is how you communicate the evidence that you could change the focus, so you could emphasize particular things, you could really have a lot of power to influence policy, and that has responsibility. So over to Martin. Well, I think it's quite difficult because in this country, the Prime Minister has frequently appeared at his press conferences flanked by the Chief Scientific Advisor and the Chief Medical Officer. And in the most recent one of those, it was very clear that both of the advisors were very uncomfortable with the decisions that were being announced. There has been a concern that by having them present, uh, they have been there giving legitimacy to political decisions. Uh, and although I think their body language and their comments have made it clear that they do have concerns about this, it's a very fine line to tread. I've, I'm firmly in the camp of uh, those who believe that academics have a responsibility to speak truth to power. Rudolf Virchow, who many of you will have remembered from the 18. 15 and 60s, well, he was a pathologist, was asked to investigate an epidemic of typhus in Silesia in a part of Poland, uh, German, uh, Austria, Poland at the time. And um, of course, uh, he, he looked at the biological factors that were involved, but typhus was a disease of the poor. And uh, he was very clear that the way in which you would tackle that was by overturning the power of the aristocracy and also of the church, which kept the ar aristocracy in power. So I think we do have a role to play, but it's really easy for me to say that in the United Kingdom, because I do have the protections of law uh, 
to, I mean, that doesn't mean that politicians cannot attack you, uh, but it is, uh, I don't think anybody is at risk of their life. That is not the case in many other countries, unfortunately, as we know, and I won't go into the countries, but some of them are involved. Some of them are represented here where journalists in particular, the investigative journalists who play a similar role to academics in drawing these things out. Um, it's, can, it can be very dangerous. Um, I don't think there's anybody from Malta here, but we do know the case of Malta as an example of where um, a, ver a very courageous journalist was murdered uh, in circumstances that point to the involvement of some politicians in Slovakia. We had a similar case and you know, we have had a number of uh, examples. So I think we need to be very cautious uh, about uh, what we what we say uh, in some places, particularly where you have authoritarian leaders that are not reluctant, that are, are willing to encourage the use of lethal force against those people who disagree with them. And I think the countries here know which ones I'm talking about. Thank you, Martin. Would anybody like to jump in at this time? Um, also, a quick note on that. Uh, there was also a, a, a very interesting discussion on that in the Philippines, like how much politics do we allow in health? And um, and also, uh, the, the academia actually has been very active, both informally and formally. Uh, formally meaning being invited as part of technical working groups, as well as uh, informally by forming independent study groups to question or to raise questions around government decisions. But as Martin would say, that um, of course um, we also need to um, understand the boundaries like in what way can we um, legitimately say um, our, our, our evidence how can, how can we communicate our evidence and how can it be useful in the debate and, and also it really depends on the context and how much freedom or how much uh, space can, can academics participate in, in, this, uh, in this discussion. Great, thank you, Kathy. With that, uh, I believe we are 10 minutes over and we did have a very fruitful discussion there. I wanna thank all of our presenters one last time. Uh, if there's any closing remarks, now's an opportunity to do so. If not, I will go ahead and, and sign off. But before, before I do so. Thank you. Before I do so, I just wanted to let all participants know that this webinar is going to be followed by a series of engagements with colleagues who are interested in the development and use of HPSR in the Western Pacific region. We're, con we're, co we're going to be connecting with researchers and institutions within the region with the idea of developing HPSR training packages, national plans, supporting funding applications. So please, if you're interested in being involved, get in touch with us. Thank you Thank once you. again. Thank you. And goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. 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 Thank you.